welcome to those of you in, uh, in virtual land to our panel discussion on methods through the madness, improving the policing system in America. We have a great group of panelists today, and I'm excited to hear from each and every one of them. I want to kick it off with uh, an expert on our indigenous peoples. Uh, Dr. Lourdes Krakow is an, in, uh, I'm sorry, an Acadian Cree researcher. Acadian Cree. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, and as well as a performer and human rights activist and consultant. Uh, she is uh, one of our panelists who is a classically trained musician. She also is a former CEO of a production company. She has her bachelor's in English language literature and music performance. She has her master's and doctorate in Applied Linguistics and American Indian Studies, and another master's in human rights pra practice. She is a veteran of our U.S. Armed Forces and the recipient of an Air Force Humanitarian Service Medal for her per performance as a first responder. Uh, she is an expert on Indigenous people and their dealings with conflict, which is why she's sitting on our panel here. So, Dr. Krakow, how do the indigenous people handle intertribal conflict? Tell us about um, that. I can try. I'm gonna try to do it in five minutes. Uh, um, we now we had intertribal conflict, obviously. I mean, some of these are, you know, the Creek Wars. Most people have heard of. Uh, everybody's seen movies like Last of the Mohican. They've seen Geronimo, you know, all those kind of thing. Um, but what happens with intertribal warfare, where they call it tribe, but we lived in bands, okay? And so the bands, all right, our tribe is more like a, a much larger collective of uh, whole families that have different lineages and they come together. So intertribal warfare generally was a band. Um, getting into it with another band um, because most often there was a raiding happening. So we had many, uh, many peoples. Uh, I think the Pawnee are probably among the most famous, originally the Navajo, who were, uh, well, they were raiders. They were like the Vikings. So after putting up with it and putting up with it and putting up with it, and when the talks didn't work, then it came to this last decision. Nobody really wanted to get to that point. So there was an enormous amount of counseling and concession being made. Um, Hiawatha is a famous figure um, with the Iroquois, with the Ojibwe people. Um, their uh, famous um, rule of law, or the rule of peace, actually, um, happened when one of their own chiefs, because each band has its own leader, who was just so notoriously violent, and he just wasn't going to have anything to do with his peace you don't want anything to do with it. Uh, so uh, they pushed and pushed and pushed and fought with him and fought with him. And the more they fought, the more powerful he became. Something happened. Somebody close to him died as a result. So he finally makes a concession and asks to be put through the ceremony so he could adopt this new law. Okay. Um, and he's sort of, if you want to, on a way converted. And... Um, that was one way to solve intertribal warfare or even intra-tribal within bands also. Sorry, this phone's on. And um, it, it generally happens with a pretty serious infraction over time. Uh, so that's about as much as I can put in it in five minutes. How's that? <laughs> if you want to know about any specific incident, you may remember, I can tell you about it. You actually did great. And, and we have a couple of... We, we have a couple of minutes left. So I'll talk do it. To us about how indigenous people see the, uh, you know, the, the bigger picture, the worldview of interaction, right? And, and what that leads to in, in beliefs. The worldview and interaction. So in modern times and or traditional times, I mean, the way we, many indigenous people see the world today in terms of conflict. Sure. 
Okay, because now, and always with a disclaimer, we feel that one of us cannot speak for all of us. Um, when we say indigenous, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people in the world. We all see conflict differently. If you ask the Yanomamo in South uh, America, they would say it was done when they came back with somebody's arm. But that's, hey, problem Not solved. Very peaceful resolution, but. Uh, they tend to have a finality to things. I'll put it to you that way. If you ask somebody, Cree, we have a story of something called um, a wittigo, which I can tell later if you want. It means cannibal, ever hungry. Um, these are the kind of people that force you into conflict. So the way we see conflict is it's your, uh, it is in the nature of some people to be incredibly combative and aggressive. It's foolish to deny it. But it's also, for the rest of the people, it's a choice. As long as someone's talking, there's a chance to resolve it, as long as they're communicating. In some level, then you have a chance. That's how we see it. With what's happened with the world, currently, in my own circles, we sit around and say, the Wittigo are back, that they've come back. The, uh, and uh, that's our, I guess, our metaphor for what's happening. It's people um, always putting themselves uh, and their own needs above those of others. And it's also no one being, no one being respected or listened to. That's how we see conflict. We see that it's just not, nobody's willing to compromise. But the thing that's making them not willing to compromise, that's what we're why so that's uh, currently in my own circles this is the kind of things we talk about and this is how we see it but we see it as unless it is in your nature to be a very combative person you know a born fighter you know um it's a choice so we see it as let's talk about making better choices well that's that's something i think that applies uh, worldwide, certainly across uh, North American society right now, there's a lot of room for better choices. So uh, for those of you who had uh, tuned in to hear from First Assistant Chief Lashana Potts, now of Columbus Police Department, I, I unfortunately have to report that uh, Columbus had an issue this morning and she is dealing with that and will not be able to attend us. Uh, Chief Potts was coming on because of her career in law enforcement. She actually started in Detroit police as an officer and rose through the ranks, uh, becoming a supervisor, a sergeant and lieutenant there and leading her own precinct as a captain, which is uh, the point in time where she and I had gotten connected. She uh, started several community initiatives reaching out to build relationships with the community which is, I think, uh, something that needs to be more prevalent through police departments. Uh, and I think will become more commonplace. In fact, I think that was a large part of her being hired as the first assistant chief in Columbus to take those initiatives and, and develop those relationships in Columbus. Uh, I, I do wanna say, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm hosting this as a 20 year veteran of a police department in Michigan. I worked at Lansing Police, one of the uh, top 25 worst cities in America in uh, violent crime. And so I come from that background and have been uh, a citizen community member now for five years. And, and of course, the tumultuous year that we had last year led me to want to do something to try to resolve that. So uh, I I do believe that we host these to encourage police departments to the changes that need to be made and to encourage citizens to work with police departments in that regard. So uh, unfortunately, Chief Potts wasn't able to join us today, but uh, I wanted her to be able to share her story with you firsthand and uh, look forward to doing that in future meetings. Uh, as we talk about uh, police departments and the changes that need to be made. We have with us from the 
great city of New York, an expert in organizational psychology. <laughs> an expert in organizational psychology. She has a double bachelor's in psychology and management science with her master's in organizational psychology. She has, uh, she founded Leverage Assessments with expertise in development, validation, and administration of fair selection tests. And their company offers services, including psychological assessments, credentialing management, remote proctoring, diversity recommendations, adverse impact review, promotional tests, and job analysis. She is with us today as the CEO of Community Policing Strategies, which is a group of experts working collaboratively to solve the problems in our communities. So, Kiana, as- <laughs> You're doing right. No, anytime the introduction starts with the great city of New York, you're bound to make me chuckle, but go ahead. Uh, well, it, it, it's supposed to be the greatest city, right? We're okay. I'm, we're fair. We're, do, we're, <laughs> we're doing all right. All right. Well, with your expertise and experience with organizational culture, why do you think that uh, police departments may be slow to change? Police department, forgive me because what you're hearing in the background might be noise from the construction that is currently happening in my building. Um, but police departments are slow to change because they are just like any other government agencies and generally government agencies are slow to change. Um, you know, our government administrations are very large, complex systems with layers of the, the judiciary and the legislative and the, the implementation. Um, and it takes years to, you know, move a mountain just like it takes years <laughs> to move a government agency. So it's not that it's specific to police. It's something that is that is commonplace to uh, to movement within our, our our city, state, or federal uh, government agencies. So, are there organizations that you have worked with that that you have seen faster change? Are there lessons that we can take from other agencies or organizations? Um. I would say that the private sector definitely moves a lot more quickly. The private sector moves more quickly because they don't necessarily have to administer processes in a, in a democratic fashion, right? They don't necessarily have to uh, answer to the public. They don't manage uh, tax dollars, right? <laughs> so they don't have to respond to their constituent requests. Um, so they're able to make changes, you know, on a dime or in a month or in a quarter. Um, our government agencies don't have the same luxury, um, while there are practices that we can certainly implement and transport in order to use to facilitate the process of change. I don't know that they will allow us to change more quickly. I also don't know that quick change is exactly what we want. I mean, when we think about what we hmm. want for the future of our uh, society and for our culture, is it something quick? I mean, do you want a, you know, do you think that you are going to get a, a thorough solution to, you know, to remaking your community, like something that you pull out of a microwave? Or do we feel that this is something that we should think about working on and creating a long-term vision for and working towards on an ongoing basis? No, I, I wholeheartedly agree, uh, it, you know, fast, Fast change and decisions can, can feel good, but that doesn't always mean they're the right decisions. And when we're talking about something that's so large and so important, taking that time to make the decision, probably the right thing to do. And it gives us the time to hear from more people, right? To do more research. Absolutely. And I think that quick decisions can sometimes put you further back than you would have been if you stopped and, and took the time. I mean, certainly, in a business or, or with anything, right? When you, when you stop and you do a long-term plan, whether it's a one-year, two-year, five-year plan, 
you'll find that you're able to actually move more quickly because you've created a roadmap, right? You've, been, mm-hmm. you've included all the stakeholders in, in a thorough discussion. Like by creating the plan, uh, you're able to move in a linear fashion. Um, generally, when you make fast decisions in a business or in any other fashion, you end up wasting resources and maybe making whatever problem it is that you have worse. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the saying my dad always tried to teach me was, the good things take time and great things take time and planning. So take more time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> so, what do you think it will take to change policing from an organizational psychology perspective? Um, you know, from an organizational psychology perspective. I mean, I've, I've kind of been an organization psychologist all my life, so I can't, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to separate the two. I know that as mm-hmm. a citizen though, I believe that we need to pursue a multi-stakeholder approach. I, need that, I, I believe that we need to pursue um, approaches to change that include all of the stakeholders, which include our citizens, our residents, our elected officials mm-hmm. and our uh, police officers to have conversations and develop a vision for the communities and the cities of the future that they want to live and serve in. That that sounds a lot like the way we do it. Yes. By Um, negotiation and mutual uh, agreement. And then with an infraction, it's again, uh, all the stakeholders input is taken in and then when we move we move together because we took the time to exactly share the map that's right bring everybody together and i think that everybody's expertise needs to value needs to be valued at the same level i think at current you know we have we have this very sort of hierarchical uh fractured system of elected officials on the top and then experts you know, that come in from wherever to tell you about wonderful things that they do, <laughs> you know, from some land far away. Uh, and then we have our, mm-hmm. our citizens and our residents who we expect to be able to offer their expertise, which we don't value because we generally expect them to come and offer it for free. I think that we need to start with having everybody on a level playing field and bringing all the stakeholders in together um, with some equity to discuss uh, what what changes they want to see and have have their input equally valued um, as the experts or as the elected officials. Mm. If people are a part of the change as well, they are more likely to implement those changes. I think this is one of the challenges that we face now, which is that if you have somebody come in, some expert consultant come in and make changes in your compute community and they're an absentee and you were absentee because you didn't know that the project was going on, mm-hmm. you know, how can you be expected? First of all, the buy-in from the residents is not there. And how can you be expected to, to implement the, the changes or, you know, of that plan? Um, including everyone in the change is what's more likely to make it stick, what's more likely to make it effective. It does take more time and I, I don't think, uh in today's society that everybody is willing to wait for the time to, to do things right. We'll, we'll come back well, to that because that's a, that's a, a large movement going on right now. But yeah. I want to- And people get don't it. have to wait, they have to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. There it is right I'm there. Mute. <laughs> oh, me too, I'm on call. Uh, I want to get a response from our race reconciliator a uh, man who was a career musician and actor who took it upon himself to start resolving issues with some some radical racists, some white supremacists. Uh, Mr. Daryl Davis took those experiences and authored the book, uh, Clandestine Relationships. He is the subject of the film Accidental Courtesy, which you can find on Amazon Prime. Uh, and I highly encourage that. That's a, it's a great film with, uh, of course, him as, as the star. Uh, and he's got a book coming out, The Clan Whisperer. He is a national lecturer on race relations and has personally, personally helped over 200 people walk away from a life of extremism. Mr. Daryl Davis, 
as we hear from, uh, from these experts and especially Kiana Beckwith on uh, changing police organizations, how do these views compare with your work dealing with those in, in racially radical or organizations and, and fit with your experience? Well, I think they're in line with it, as uh, Kiana pointed out, and as Lourdes pointed out, you know, things need to be on an even playing field. And I believe that community police relations need to improve, but also accountability needs to improve because, you know, police demand of, um, of citizens uh, to cooperate with them and to view them as human beings. You know, these are people who put their lives on the line every day, every, you know, every time they get up and go out of their house to go to work, they're putting their lives on the line to serve and protect us, the citizenry of the, uh, of the uh, jurisdiction in which they serve. But when, when they make a mistake or do something, you know, um, untoward, uh, then you know they want to be considered. Well, you know we're human beings too. You know mistakes do happen. Yes, absolutely. But the same way citizens are held accountable. Uh, you know we are charged. We are we are uh, evaluated based on our mistakes. We have a record that can be seen in public. Uh, so like if you have done something, uh, Anthony or anybody on the panel, I can go to I I can look up your record and find out you know, what you had done. Uh, police officers are protected by something called the um, LEOBR, the Law Enforcement uh, Officers Bill of Rights, where they don't reveal uh, their personnel records. You know, If they've gotten in, into trouble within the department, internal affairs investigations, things like that, uh, we don't have access to that. Uh, it has to be subpoenaed. It, it may come out in court or something like that. But, uh, but the average, like, you know, if you, if you go and make a complaint to internal affairs about about an officer, you won't even know um, what the what the uh, the reprimand may be if that person gets reprimanded. That that is that is kept inside the personnel record, and you don't know. All you know is your complaint was unfounded, unsustained, or sustained. That's all you. That's all you get to find out. Um, I don't think that you know that that furthers more distrust from the public because we want to trust the police. We need the police and they want to trust us. But when we can't, you know, when you can find out my record and I can't find out yours, then it's like, you know, well, why? You know, this person, this person probably just got a slap on the wrist or, or a uh, tongue lashing by his superior and that's it. Uh, you know, maybe that was it or maybe the guy did get um, a more severe punishment. But until we know that they're being treated accountably like we're being held accountable as well. Because, you know, they have higher powers than we do. You know, they have the color of authority. They have a, a 007 license. You know, if they have to pull a gun and shoot somebody, uh, most people don't have that. And, they, and when they do that, they are protected by that color of authority. So along with giving them higher powers should also come higher accountability. Um, and for example, um, right now, the vast majority of states in this country do not take away pensions from police officers who have been convicted of, uh, of felonies. Like where I live right now, state of Maryland does not do that. There are a few states that will do that. Uh, there, there are some states that do it partially, depending upon the crime. Like if, if the cop was a uh, child molester or had done some you know, felonious thing, they might take away the pension. Others, it depends upon the crime. But um, you know, something like that you know, needs to be held accountable because the average citizen who goes out here and commits a crime uh, cannot, you know, and goes to prison cannot make a profit off of that crime. Like say somebody offers that, that person a, a movie deal or a book deal, he or she cannot profit from that. So why, why should a police officer continue to get um, a pension when they have done something that has destroyed the lives of, um, of, of an individual or a whole family of people because you took away their kid or whatever and you've been convicted of that? Why can't some of that pension go 
I mean, nothing's going to bring that person back and nothing's going to help that person. But a lot, a lot of victims are, are in psych, psychotherapy the rest of their lives because of something that has happened to them. Like, you know, somebody gets pulled over on, on the premise of, um, of speeding and then she gets raped by, by an officer. This has happened as well. And, uh, and that person is in psychotherapy the rest of her life. Why can't some of that pension go to pay for some of that psychotherapy? Yeah, I certainly think that we need to look at, and, and I'm speaking here, uh, not as the panelist host, but I, I would uh, ask a police administrator to respond. So I'm, I'm speaking a little bit in that capacity. I think that we need to uh, do, as you said, in, increase accountability on both sides. Uh, and we need to look at, at some the way some of those uh, things can be changed uh, across our country. Uh, certain things like a national police registry that uh, allows right. more open open view to the public. Uh, I do have uh, have a unique background on the panel as somebody who sat in that position, and I get uh, I get two things from the police side. One that uh, that too much uh, could allow, and this again goes back to the police department's choices, but too much could allow for officer shopping. Uh, and most police agencies will have a policy that uh, the neighborhood officer or the closest officer will respond to a call simply so that uh, I can't say I, I only want to talk to a white male officer or uh, on, the, on the other side, I could say that I only want to talk to a, a white female or black female officer. We, we can't have that. Uh, the legal system should be blind to uh, any, any kind of bias. But uh, the other side... Absolutely. Absolutely, you know, and and I think some departments further enable that bias. Like, for example, uh, I had suggested a long time ago uh, to a police department, you know, they had taken their internal affairs officers out of uniform, and now they wear suits and ties. And I questioned uh, the chief as to why, you know, they're doing that. And they said, because in this area, we have a very diverse population. A lot of people here from South American countries, et cetera, et cetera. And some of them come from countries where police forces were very brutal to them. So they see a, a uniform, you know, they shy away from it. So it's hard for us to get information from somebody like that in a uniform. And if, if somebody does something, if, a, if an officer has done something to them, uh, you know, they're afraid to complain to somebody in a uniform because the person you're complaining to looks just like the person who brutalized you. And so psychologically, it's not good for them. So we, 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 we dress in, in our civilian clothes for internal affairs. And I said, well, you know, all that does is enable them because what you're telling them subliminally is, you know, we have two sets of cops. The cops in, in suit and tie are the good cops. The cops in the uniforms are the bad cops. What you need to show these people, or anybody for that matter, is not to fear the badge and gun. Yes, there are going to be people in suits and ties who can be bad, and there are going to be people in uniforms who can be bad. But what we want to do is uphold the police department, respect all police officers, and if somebody in a uniform is bad, then don't broad brush the whole department because of the actions of one. Show that person who is brutalized by somebody in a uniform that somebody in another in, in the same uniform is going to help them because that was wrong. So, you know, get that image of the badge and gun means that, you know, those are bad people. It's only the cops in a suit and tie that are good. Why, why exacerbate that mentality? Right. Yeah, that has to be done across the board. And, and the second part of that is, I think you address it well, the lawsuits and liability that the family who's lost someone uh, unreasonably I, I has a right to some repercussion in that some financial uh, return. Uh, but the, uh, I, I think on both, I think you had a great response. If some of that individual officer's pension were to go to compensate them, that solves part of that problem. Uh, I think cities, not just departments, but uh, municipalities and counties have gotten a little defensive because of worrying about lawsuits. And I think often don't share information, hoping that it will never come out to try to minimize their liability. Exactly. And if, 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 a, if an officer's pension, uh, you know, was compromised, 
would that would that mitigate uh, any wrong behavior on that officer's part? Quite possibly. I mean, it's just like, look, you know, if I go speeding down the street and I get pulled over and get a ticket, uh, there's a good chance that I probably won't speed down that street anytime soon again. So, you know, if, if, if I know that my pension is on the line and I'm about to retire, you know, am I going to act stupid? Right. Yeah, it, it, it has that extra incentive. Uh, it, we're going to come back to Kiana and talking about rewarding the right behaviors uh, in just a minute. But uh, it, it yeah, has that piece. Thanks. Now, I, I have to ask Mr. Davis a question that I've been asked and I don't have a response to. Uh, we, we've, we've gotten past uh, segregation and the separate but equal uh, being wrong. Uh, and, and we're working on equity and inclusion, but we have large promotion of racial organizations. So uh, I, I think of Black Lives Matter, of, of black businesses. I actually was hearing a pastor talk about his black fraternity. Uh, and not just that, there are obviously Jewish organizations, there's Hispanic organizations, but why is that promotion okay when, when we're talking about equity and inclusion? Okay, I'm not saying that it's okay uh, because it's not okay, you know, that shouldn't have to exist. Um, why, why does it exist? Because of the inequity of other organizations, like for example, um, some police departments have the uh, the black police union within the same department. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the black officers are not feeling that they're getting treated the same way as the white officers. They're being passed over for promotions and things like that. So they have to come together and stand together in order to get the equity. It shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't have to have a black officer's union. We should have a police union in which every officer, Hispanic, Asian, Eskimo, black, white, whatever, are all treated equally. But when you find that certain ones are treated certain ways, just like you have women's organizations with, within a company because women are not being treated equally. They're being sexually harassed by their bosses. They're not being paid the same amount of money for doing the same amount of work as a man. They deserve to be treated equally. We, we shouldn't have to have those either. But, you know, we do because people are being treated inequitably. But, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you mentioned Black Lives Matter. Um, Black Lives Matter is not really an organization as much as it is a movement. Mm -hmm. An organization is someplace, you know, that is centralized and policy is created within headquarters. There's one president and the policy is disseminated to all the chapters around the country, like the Red Cross. So in other words, the New York City chapter of the Red Cross is on the same page as the Los Angeles chapter. There's no variation. But when you have a movement, you don't have chapters, you have factions. Mm -hmm. And each faction has its own little president. Uh, in some Black Lives Matter factions, there are more white people uh, in Black Lives Matter than Blacks. And some there are predominantly Black people. Some of them are Black supremacists. Others have Blacks and whites working together. You know, and, and each leader takes it upon his or herself to do things how he or herself wants to do it, regardless, because there is no national mandate that all chapters follow. So what happens is, uh, let's say, let's, uh, let's take New York, for example. Let's say the, uh, the Brooklyn chapter of uh, Black, or faction of Black Lives Matter. Yes, let's uh, talk about New York, yeah. Uh-oh, mm -hmm. I'm in trouble. Am, am I in trouble, Kiana? Are you from Brooklyn? <laughs> well, I wanted, I wanted actually, I wanted to ask about the term Black supremacy. Okay, that's well, I can yeah. tell you about that. I can tell you about All that. All right, yeah. I know a bunch. All right. But anyway, so let's say the Black Lives Matter um, uh, faction in Brooklyn is doing something positive. You know, they're sitting down with the city a council and the legislature trying to get bills passed to uh, remove certain statues or change names of certain buildings that were owned by slave owners or this, that, or the other, uh, whereby the uh, Bronx uh, chapter is going around, you know, spray painting graffiti all over the place and tearing stuff down. What does the press do? The press does not differentiate and say, well, Brooklyn chapter of Black Lives Matter does blah, blah, blah. It just says Black Lives Matter tore mm -hmm. down the statue. And so therefore it paints a broad brush, just like 
the citizens do when one police officer commits a transgression? Oh, you know, the Minneapolis Police Department, oh man, you know, they're, they're bad news, you know, because of Derek Chauvin, you know, one officer or whatever, something like that. So, you know, when you have a movement, uh, that's the problem. Um, the, the idea behind Black Lives Matter, I believe, was a great idea. The founders wanted to put the national spotlight on the plight of, uh, of, of Black males who were, for lack of a better word, being uh, shot and killed uh, for holding their cell phones, for you know, holding their wallets, where white men in the same situation, the majority of them, not all, but the majority of them either went to jail or went home where black men in that situation went to their grave. And, and what changed, they got the idea from Dr. King and the bus boycott. Rosa Parks was not the first black woman to refuse to give a pursuit on the bus. We know that. But uh, the, the woman that did that, she didn't make national history. That was being done all the time down there in Montgomery, Alabama, but it didn't make national news. All right, so Martin Luther King came up with the idea we need to put this on the national scene so everybody can see what's going on down here in Montgomery. And when Montgomery is put in a fishbowl, then things will change. So Black Lives Matter took that same, the founders took that same approach and said, we need to put this on the national scene so everybody can see what is happening to Black men in these situations. Great idea. But I feel that their mistake was not trademarking the name and not centralizing an organization like the NAACP, the Boy Scouts of America, the Red Cross, the whatever. Those are those are, are centralized organizations. They did not want to trademark the name. They wanted to just make it organic so everybody can form a Black Lives Matter chapter. You can walk out right now and form your own. Jeff can, I can, Acacia can, any of us can because nobody owns that name. But as a result, we're all not gonna be on the same page. And when you have too many chefs in the kitchen trying to do the same recipe, it's a disaster. So this is why we need more organization. But and Black Lives Matter was born in the wake of the uh, Trayvon Martin uh, murder. And um, you know, at the time, in 2013, at the time, I don't believe the founders realized how big that, that, that thing was going to explode. You know, they, you know they, they had no way of foreseeing George Floyd and all this other kind of thing. So you know, it was small back then. But it always pays to, you know, trademark whatever you know whatever you are you're, you're creating or in my case as a musician we copyright our music look at all these artists who wrote songs back in the day and didn't copyright them and now they're making millions of dollars and the songwriter isn't making a penny right you know okay. he who owns the copyright gets the royalties but um so and and then with black lives matter the retort to that is the people who put it down is oh well well uh, all lives matter Okay, yes, all lives do matter, but are, 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 are you considering black lives to be part of all lives? Well, well, how come black lives, you know, white lives matter too, Hispanic lives matter too? Yes, they do, absolutely. Okay, so you have a, black, you have a problem with, with, the, with the term black lives matter mm -hmm. because it doesn't mention white lives. Yeah, I have a problem with that. Okay, do you support blue lives matter? Yeah, I support blue lives matter. Well, what in Blue Lives Matter mentions white people? Nothing. It mentions blue lives. So black lives does not mention uh, white lives, but yet you, you down Black Lives Matter. Blue Lives Matter doesn't mention white mm -hmm. lives, but yet you support that. So you can tell there's a little you know, discrepancy going on there. But yes, uh, all lives matter. Get, get into, I know you just have a couple of minutes left, Mr. Davis. Uh, and I know Kiana and I wanted to hear on uh, black supremacy. You talked about that. You mentioned Okay. That. Well, black supremacy is the same as white supremacy. And, and, and Jeff can speak to this as well. You know, black supremacists and white supremacists pretty much get along because they each believe in the purity. You're laughing, but it's true. You know, people like Louis Farrakhan has, has spoken at a, mm -hmm. at, at a Klan rally. Tom Metzger spoke to, 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 to um, uh, the Nation of Islam. Tom Mesker was this, you know, uh, uh, neo-Nazi leader. Uh, he passed away a couple of years, well, about a year or so ago, um, because they believe in the purity of their race. They do not believe in miscegenation. So they respect each other on that basis. In fact, there was a Klan leader, uh, oh gosh, what was his name? I knew him, down in Florida. Um, 
John uh, John Bowman. Anyway, um, he was an imperial wizard down there. And he organized a march with some black supremacists uh, from the Pan-African um, Congress. And they marched together down the street, you know, um, because they both believe in separ separate but equal, you know, we stayed on our own kind of thing. Um, I don't agree with that myself. I don't think anybody is supreme to anybody else, you know. So I don't, I don't buy into that nonsense. But, um, but that's that, that's what it is, you know. They respect each other on that basis, you know. And, and in fact, um, if 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 I'm if I'm seen with a with a white woman, all right, by by a white supremacist, that white supremacist is going to hate that white woman more than me, yeah. even though he or she doesn't like me because that person has defiled herself. You know, how can you lower yourself? Yeah. You belong to this race. You have yeah. sold out. Just like there are black people who would, a supremacist would, would down me more, you know, than, uh, than, than the mm -hmm. white person that, that I was with. Because, you know, I'm supposed to be superior. I have downed myself. I've defiled myself. I've sold out. I'm an Uncle Tom. I'm an Oreo. I'm everything, you know, uh, but my name. We get that with Native Americans. We had that too between traditionals and uh, moderns. Um, Mr. Davis, if, I, I know yeah. you have to take off, sir. So I want to make sure to thank you for your time. Please Again, invite folks, me back. We absolutely will. And if you have the time, folks, check out uh, Accidental Courtesy on, on Amazon Prime. Hey, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, I want to see you all next time. And be sure to listen to my brother right there, Jeff Scoop. And, mm -hmm. and Lourdes and Kiana and Acacia there and Anthony. And I appreciate your all's time. Take good care. Take care, Bye -bye. sir. I, I want to hear a word from uh, our white supremacist expert. Note that I didn't say he's a white supremacist. Uh, although he has walked in those shoes. Uh, he is the founder of Beyond Barriers, which is a nonprofit organization committed to a new approach on countering and preventing extremism. And uh, note, folks, that I said nonprofit organization there. So if you're looking for somewhere to make a donation this year as we hit the end of yeah. the year, consider beyondbarriersusa.org. Uh, for 27 years, he was the leader of the largest neo-Nazi organization in the United States, the National Socialist Movement. In March of 2019, he became the highest profile former white nationalist to walk away from far-right extremism. He is uniquely qualified because of that to understand extremism and extremist ideologies. And he now works as an international extremism consultant to educate communities and policymakers on the threat of white supremacy and how to, here's the key, effectively counter and prevent that extremism. Mr. Shope, we just heard some talk on uh, those minority monikers and the now recognizing that they're there because of an inequality to begin with, but how do extremist organizations use that promotion for their own purpose? Well, thank you, Anthony. And uh, following this incredible panel is uh, always an honor and a privilege. Um, as far as uh, how organizations or people that are in uh, white supremacy organizations uh, see these type of things is they use it to air and fuel their own grievances. And I'm not saying that's uh, right or wrong or anything like that, but they do utilize that. So when what we do know about uh, extremist organizations is that they're fear-based. A lot of people say that they're hate-based. We say hate is fostered there. Hate is definitely a part of it, but hate is not the driving factor. The driving factor is truly fear. Um, most of them wouldn't acknowledge that. I can, I can say that I certainly wouldn't have acknowledged that in the years that I was there. It's, those are things that you process and you see after you come out. Um, when you're there, someone says, oh, you're afraid of white genocide or you're afraid of this. You say, nah, I'm not afraid of nothing. You know, nobody, nobody will admit that. So uh, that's a big part of it there. So when they see organizations um, that are which is interesting, you know, race-based organizations uh, or gender-based organizations or religious-based organizations in some cases, um, whereas people in the extremist movement see Jewish people as a, as a major threat or in the case of 
uh, organization like Black Lives Matter, they see that as a threat. But um, any, anything of that nature, anytime there's organiza- organizing against that type of thing, uh, they see that as a concern or they, they, and they view that with fear and that fear turns to hatred. And what's interesting about that or the irony about that is they don't see what they're doing as being wrong. It's very hypocritical. It's very ironic when looking at it from the outside uh, going in. If you say, well, so-and-so, John or Bill, whatever, over here, John is part of uh, the Klan or, or part of a whatever white nationalist movement. Um, and he's angry because these people are invo- uh, of other races are involved in these race-based organizations. That's hypocrisy at its finest. Like, how can you, how can you criticize that with a clear, a clear conscience? And they, they can't. They can't really explain that because it's, they don't see that part. Um, and that's why it's so, in, so important, I think, as a, as a community, as, as a people, as a nation, that we use relational dialogue, that we, we get back to the table, um, you know, as Daryl was explaining about why there's the need for these organizations like a, a, a Black police union or, or women's organizations and things like that. I mean, that's the best way um, to possibly explain it. We shouldn't have to have those things. We shouldn't have to have that, but it's because of the inequality <clears throat> that that we're facing as a as a nation that we that we do have those things. So as a whole and as a greater uh, as a greater whole, we have to get beyond that. You know, relational dialogue, civil discourse, conflict resolution, whatever you want to call it. Beyond barriers, the organization that uh, that we formed, uh, some of the panelists are, are here today, are from. You know, we work in the extremes. Uh, the divide between the police and the community right now is quite chaotic. It's quite extreme. And that's unfortunate because we need policing in this country. We can't, uh, you know, this whole defund the police movement. We saw in areas where that's taken hold. It's been an absolute disaster um, when police departments budgets were cut. Um, you know, so we have to we have to look at this uh, and include the local communities, getting to know our local communities. Every community is different. The police and the community relationship needs to improve. And a lot of that is going, going to be done through relational dialogue, through understanding, through town hall meetings, through things of this nature where people get to know each other. We have to be able to have, we have to be able to reconnect with our humanity. And that's, that's what we do. That's what we're good at. That's where our expertise comes in uh, at Beyond Barriers is when you get involved in an extremist group and you're working with an extreme, you lose track of your own humanity because you're not able to see the humanity of others. And once you cannot see the humanity of others, you've lost your humanity in the process. So we need to rehumanize individuals, society as a whole, and stop dehumanizing one another. Because when you're dehumanizing one another, you're losing track, you're losing your own humanity in the process, whether you realize it or not. And most people that do it don't realize it. They think they're doing good, noble, positive things. They think, they believe they're doing good things. But what they don't see is how they've lost their own humanity in the process. They think they're the good guys. But when they're dehumanizing other human beings, they are that which they fear. They are... (laughs) that enemy basically their 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 own worst enemy um and as far as in the police and community relationship um i I like what i think it was daryl or uh was one of the one of the panelists said had said it if i if i uh mixed up who it was i didn't write it on my notes here but uh accountability accountability is really important when it it comes to these these relationships so um and one of the panelists had mentioned about um uh, there not being accountability in some cases or not uh, where there's distrust of the police and especially in the minority communities a lot of the um, minorities <clears throat> that uh, that I'm friends with or that I know in my personal life they many of them I, I don't want to say all but many of them have horrific stories of uh, you know mm-hmm. dealing with the police and things like it's that. all of them <laughs> I, oh I do too. I do too. If, uh, because being in an extremist organization, yes, I had lots of bad experiences uh, you know, over the years. So I, I do understand it. So uh, but I think I went over my five minutes there, uh, Anthony. Sorry. That's, that's all right. We're getting into, we're, we're well into Q&A time, but it, I, I want to make sure that I, I understand correctly. And I emphasize this because what we heard from Daryl was that those, uh, the minority promoting groups exist to to try to build equal treatment 
where, where they feel there's inequality. And yet what the white supremacists do then is use that to fear, to, to fuel the fear of whites, uh, of whites being- the Fear of white genocide. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. so then, then they come across as the good guys to white people by dehumanizing minorities again. So we have this vicious cycle that we fall into. Is that, that's what you're saying, right, Yeah, so they wouldn't refer to it as dehumanizing. They look at it, right. and this is, this is what a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people think a lot of these white supremacists are on the offense, or they view them on the offense, especially from the minority communities. I, I don't want to speak for them. I don't have that right. But in my experience and from talking with people and, and uh, working in, in dialogue, a lot of them feel like white supremacists are on the offense. The white supremacists, if you ask them, and, and from my experience, they don't feel like that at all. They feel like they're on the defense and they're defending their yeah. culture. They're defending their people. So it's there's a real disconnect between our, our communities and between our people. And what this does as a whole to America is devastating because it's dividing us. Just like we're seeing with the Democrats and the Republicans now, we are divided as a nation, which makes us weak, which makes us open to threats from out from the outside, whether it's communist China, whether it's you know whoever, whoever that... Uh, you know, external threat can be, well, even if there's not an external threat, it breaks down the cohesiveness of our society and our ability as a country to come together when there's these divides and then people distrust each other and it just breaks down the social cohesion altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say I'm, I'm going to jump into my panelist seat here as a, as a police officer for one second because I do want to say, and, and if you're pro-police, I do want to say that, yes, I, I, I feel we should do more to one share what's going on in police departments and in policing actions. Uh, Columbus PD, I will use as a highlight, had a shooting of a young uh, black female earlier this summer, but they had released uh, body cam footage from the officer the very same day. Uh, that, you know, it's that kind of openness that we need to see from police departments. On the other side of that, we need to hold them accountable when, when actions go bad. I also want to say that I do think we need to do more to hold citizens accountable for improper actions. Uh, Chicago area had uh, two black men who uh, preemptively shot a police officer because they said they were afraid and that is not in any way okay. Uh, anytime we as citizens are walking down the street and feel afraid, it doesn't give us the right to shoot uh, anybody on the street. So I think that doubly applies not only to law enforcement, but anyone in our uh, greater government, the, even our government buildings. We have to respect the, the overarching civil authority that we've created and work through the process to change that. Now, I want to hit uh, real quick, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to, uh, to you, Lords, real quick, and then turn final comments over to Kiana. Uh, Jeff talked about uh, the Relational Dialogue Program a program that uh, works on humanizing, if I'm getting his terminology right, humanizing and interrelations uh, with others. So how do you think, it, given, our, given your expertise and our topic here on working on police departments and police community relations, Lords, how do you see that, uh, that working in, in communities with police agencies? A relational dialogue program uh, between the, the community and the police? Yes. Um, it mirrors what um, Kiana was saying, where um, you're getting people on the same page. You have stakeholders. We all live in areas together uh, and die in areas together. Right. So the business of uh, being human, you know, is conducted, all right? Uh, we want equality, but some of us have authority, the others don't. And so a relational dialogue is this, is that you don't just isolate an incident or an individual because neither exist or occurred in a vacuum. Relational has a lot to do with reciprocal. So we can say the dark side of reciprocity is the young people who shot the police officer because they were afraid. That's a reciprocal response. They had a reason to be afraid. So a relational dialogue has to be conducted in full cognizance 
of who's accountable, who's responsible, who's afraid, who needs what, and how do we together get things done. Um, it also accepts the fact that, uh, like in the story I had ready, maybe not enough time, that there are people who, who will cooperate, right? but they won't participate. They step out, and the best you can get them to do is not interfere. You have to understand individuality, but you also have to understand the relationship. How do citizens see the police and the relationship to the police? How do the police see the relationship to their own industry? What do they expect? We don't actually know. We've never asked police, policemen and women, what do they expect out of their own agencies? As if as if they were just some mythical creatures that magically appear, ruin your lives, and go away, and it's horrible. How do you not reify them? You m monsterize them. When there's no relationship, you get a rogue, a lone wolf, a frightening, unknown thing. When you have a relational dialogue, people and events are situated, you understand? Happening in a place and a time that's manageable, something we can get our hands on. It's a board that we can set and move pieces together and come up with, a, with an outcome, a better outcome. So that's specifically how those things are uh, integrated. You just got to be willing to do it. So there has to be a tremendous incentive to get people to do it. Yeah, that's a good point. We have to have the, uh, the incentive. We, we uh, at Peace call that the perspective mindset. We have to be open to see what, uh, what is being seen from the other side perspective as anything. So uh, Ms. Beckles, as we wrap up our hour here, uh, that uh, relational, I'll give you the opportunity if you wanna comment on uh, something we, we briefly mentioned earlier, the, uh, the uh, disconnect between goal settings and rewards in organization uh, I know uh, we had emailed a bit on that or uh, uh, on Mr. Shope's relational dialogue and how you see that playing out in cities. Listen, there's a lot I'd like to comment on. Um, and <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't even express how exhilarating it, it, has been, it, it has been to be on a panel with you folks, um, to be on a panel with a, with a clan whisperer and an imperial wizard all in one day, definitely makes your day. I want to say to Jeff, I appreciate you for the work that you do. It is quite amazing to, to essentially do a 180, right, and, and, and grow up as a member of, uh, of a hate group and then turn that around and say, no, I want to be a part of the solution. I think that, that is incredibly amazing. Um, and thank you because you, you, you may have saved many lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a ton of stuff that we that we need to talk about and it, we need to just extend we need to just do an extension or do another day um but i'm going to um skip over all this other stuff that i would love to comment on and talk about the alignment of incentives um because that's the piece that you and i spoke about you know accountability is important um it, all the all the other pieces that we that we spoke about are important you know when we talk about uh, you know, like a revenge killing or something like that. Our citizens are now shooting police officers, right? That's, that's not what we want at all. None of that is what we want. Um, what we want is we want to have safe communities and we need to define together what safety looks like and what role each of us is going to play in being a part of that safety. To your point, Lord, as yeah, there are some people who the best they can do is just step back and let the rest of us work. And if that's the best that they can do, they need to just go ahead and do that. I think that for our police organizations, um, what we need to do is we need, we need to make sure that we are being clear about what we are incentivizing them to, to do. I think right now, we still, uh, policing is still, um, the productivity is still measured by the amount, by punitive actions, by the amount of arrests that you make and the amount of, of collars that you pull in or the amount of tickets that you write. As long as we continue to incentivize uh, or measure productivity this way, we'll never get the newer community policing models that we wanna see, right? You can train mm -hmm. and emphasize de-escalation all day, but if at the end of the day, you're getting rewarded or you're getting your vacation based on how many tickets you write, or uh, you know,
you know, how many arrests you make, um, you, you've misaligned now the train, the, right, the ideals of the training and the actual uh, incentives that the organization is expressing um, to reinforce, because that's what those things are there. They're supposed to be there to reinforce the trainings. Um, we need to go back and really realign our organizations from the top down, starting with the mission, right? And identifying what that model of safety is and what we wanna see for our communities. And then drilling down to make sure that our KPIs and our metrics and our performance metrics align with the, with the vision that we wanna see and then making sure that we're tracking the actions like de-escalation, um, like uh, conflict resolution, like negotiation, all these things that we wanna see, we have to make sure that we're tracking them in our KPIs towards the mission. That was a lot in of itself. And I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. I wanna comment on all this other stuff. People were talking about holding citizens accountable. I mean, we talked about black supremacy. There was a lot. There was a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, I know this was your first panel discussion. They all go like this, Kiana. So we'll we'll have you back so we can delve into some of that because I I I want to get into just some of what you said with mission alignment and KPI and you know how that condenses and forces officers to try to work quickly. And yet we know for a fact that that de-escalation is something that takes time. So how do we help resolve that and understand that as community members? And, and all of that, I, I, I want to make sure this is well understood. Everything that you're talking about, that's really low cost, right? That's cheap to implement. You muted. So, uh, so while, I, while I definitely understand doing an analysis of police budget, and I think that you know, for any organization, it's always good to go back and do an audit of your budget, look at what you're spending, make sure that you're, that you're again, aligning your spend with, you're investing in what you wanna see. Um, obviously, like we said in the beginning, right? Doing just a deep chop of a budget somewhere, doing a, you know, just doing away with an organization altogether um, is, is, not gonna, is not gonna be the answer to our problems. I mean, we, we got the problems in our communities um, they are long, they are deep, and they are complex, uh -huh. and they're not going to be solved, you know, in a day uh -huh. with one sweeping resolution. Um, uh -huh. So we have to create solutions that are just as deep and long and complex as the problems are that we have. And yeah, if you want to implement new models, if you want to, you know, if you want to implement new fancy trainings, and if you want to completely revolutionize our police departments, those things do take an investment. Um, so we have to figure out, we have to decide together uh, where those resources come from. Mm -hmm. um, because again, there's a misalignment if we're saying we want to take away all of their money, but we want them also to you know, retrain and revolutionize and reinvest. Yeah. Um, there isn't really a way to execute that without the budget. Everything takes dollars. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, if you are watching, uh, as, a, as a viewer here, uh, I recognize we're a little late. We started a little late and we're still over our hour, just barely. Uh, I, I know on my side, I feel it's been a productive hour. I feel like it, it, there's been a bunch of information that people can use to, to share in their community. So I want to thank you all for your time and I will say good day and stay graceful.